All right, folks, join us again for another Bible study. And I want to let you know that the website, shotgunout.com, right here has been updated. I'll put the link below this video. It's been updated. And we added this right here, how to defeat an atheist in a debate. And when we say defeat an atheist, we don't mean that we're harming them or anything like that, maybe just their ego. <laughs> when we say defeat in a debate, we mean how to show them that the worldview of atheism is bankrupt. And don't forget to watch our latest video on the motorcycle, Eight Dumb Things About Atheism. Pretty good. And then we have lots of free books for you here and so forth and so on. This is a great Christian music video. You got to check that out also. Let's begin. So let's start off with Acts 9. Now, if you guys ever watch Star Wars, and I know Star Wars is a fictional movie, but it helps to explain what's going on here. So Star Wars, there's a character called Boba Fett, Boba Fett, and he's like a uh, bounty hunter. And remember in uh, the early Star Wars movies, he captures Han Solo and they freeze Han Solo and, and all that good stuff. Well, Saul in Scripture is a type of uh, bounty hunter, except he's hunting Christians. But he's not just hunting them and freezing them like, like uh, Boba Fett. He's ruthless with the Christians, even causing them to be put to death. So we're going to read what happens to to Saul and later on he has a miraculous conversion and he becomes one of the key players in the spreading of Christianity because Saul who later they change his name to Paul because he's a he's born again but Saul Paul was absolutely brilliant he was considered one of the higher intellectuals of that time absolutely brilliant and he was very very passionate about God and about his religion so notice then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way we'll talk about that what that means whether men or women he might bring them bound to Jerusalem so he wants these authoritative letters permission to go seize these Christians and remember how Jesus would always say look I am the way the truth and the life nobody comes to the father except through the son and Jesus talked about how you know we are all condemned already we're already dead in our sins and our sins are forgiven if we put our hope faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross we repent of our sins and we turn to him and you know what I see here notice what are the Christians doing all they're doing is is they're rejoicing and they're spreading the good news that they've found notice the way the way to God the way to eternal life the way to extreme joy but isn't it interesting that whenever there's something in human nature whenever you're trying to do something good there's always someone that's going to want to try to stop it now in our you know times here in America because America was founded on Christian principles you know that um, there are like 55 uh, signers of the of these documents the the Constitution the Declaration and I believe it was 53 of 55 were actually Christian every single one of them believed in God there were a couple of deists there and deism is the type of theism they just don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ um, but there were no atheists but now you notice that we have the secularist and the leftist the pro-abortion secularist that are trying to literally stop Christianity. 
Now remember Jesus said go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now what does all the world mean? Well, <laughs> we could safely say that means all the world, everywhere this gospel is to be preached. You know how you have a dark room and uh, you have a bunch of lamps in the room and you turn on all the lights and lights in every corner of the room. It's the entire room. And that's how God wants the gospel to be preached. Yes, the public schools. Yes, in our government. The gospel is to be preached everywhere. He didn't say not the godless liberal indoctrinating leftist socialist public school system. Notice everywhere is supposed to be preached. He didn't say not the government. Now you know that the founders of America, they even signed these documents in the year of our Lord referring to Jesus Christ. And Patrick Henry, you can look up his quote, Patrick Henry is a major player in the founding of America, and he said it can never be emphasized too often or too strongly that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he went on to say it is for this reason that people of other faiths and beliefs are afforded asylum to come worship here. See, Christians want other people to come to America of other beliefs and faith so we also can uh, convert them to Christianity and we could, you know, fulfill the Great Commission, which is to go out to all the world and preach the gospel. So notice here, he wants to go stop Christianity. And it notice as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a, a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it's interesting what Jesus Christ says here. And, and Saul says, who are you, Lord? Question mark. So Saul has this overwhelming presence that this is a powerful entity, powerful light. Uh, you know, he hears the voice. I believe personally that he knows it's God and he's like, okay, what did I do wrong now? And he asked, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And this is interesting. Look what Jesus says. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And a goat was uh, a pointy like stick or device they'd have different types that you would poke the animal to get it to go sort of like uh, spurs you know cowboys would wear spurs and you know or even nowadays in our modern times you know you have spurs and you're, you're riding the horse and you kind of kick right there in the middle of the horse there to get it going so Jesus is saying like you're kicking against these spikes these goads you know what I see here? Notice Jesus is saying when you're you're persecuting Christians, the way Jesus looks at it is that people are persecuting him. And so it, it is a terrifying place to be when someone is persecuting Christians because we're all one body and Jesus looks at it like you're persecuting me. Remember in scripture how Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. There's no such thing as being an agnostic in Jesus Christ's standard. Jesus Christ is not wishy-washy. He's not an agnostic. He doesn't allow people to be agnostic. Notice, he says it's black and white. You're either with him or against him. Now, let me ask you guys a question. If someone, let's say you have a friend that's, you know, not really anti-Christian, but let's say they're an atheist or they call themselves an agnostic and they're not really against you and you're a Christian and, you know, you'll go have pizza together and maybe you go to class together or you work together. And that's fine, right? But in Jesus opinion 
is that person with Jesus or against Jesus Christ? So if you're unsaved and you're listening to this, you need to realize, please, and we say this because we love you, don't go by the atheist community's opinion on Jesus Christ. Or don't you dare, for your best interest, don't you dare think that you can be agnostic about Jesus Christ. Because if you're agnostic or atheist or Muslim or Hindu, you have chosen to be a hostile combatant to Jesus Christ. Now, you may say, I'm not hostile to Jesus Christ. I have friends that are Christians. I have friends that um, are very conservative Christians. And that's fine. But you are considered in Jesus' eyes a hostile combatant against him because when you don't accept Jesus Christ, by default, are you not rejecting him? You are. If someone gives you a gift and you reject it, you are, <laughs> by default, not accepting it. So it is important to realize there's no such thing as agnosticism when it comes to the way Jesus Christ looks at things. If you're an agnostic, you must admit, according to Scripture, you are against Jesus Christ. There's a pastor um, in California and he brought this passage up and he was not a Christian and he said that this passage got to him because he realized that if he was not with Jesus Christ he was against Jesus Christ. And the, there's other scriptures that says the wrath of God abides on the sinful man. So this is why you cannot be neutral when it comes to Jesus Christ. So notice, it's also not good to harass Christians. I mean, there's a lot of people on YouTube that are constantly harassing uh, my Christian brothers and sisters. And remember, if you're doing that, the way Jesus Christ looks at that is you're just kicking against the goats. It is hard for you to do that. So what happens to Saul here? trembling and astonished he said Lord what do you want me to do okay and isn't that interesting when I became a Christian I was like well what do I do next you know you, you're so passionate about what Jesus Christ has done for you and you just want to do something and uh, you know you have the same thing happening here with Saul notice okay well what do you want me to do like What's the deal here? So Jesus says, arise and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. So notice immediately Saul is submitted. And what do I see here, guys? You know what I see here? I see what happens when you become a Christian. You totally submit your life to Jesus Christ. You're humble. And you basically say it, that's the best phrase that Saul could say. What do you want me to do? At, you show me a Christian that becomes a, you know, they're a baby Christian. They just become a Christian and they say, tell me what you want me to do. That's just a wonderful attitude to have. Now, it's interesting that there are eyewitnesses to this bright light. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. So it was so bright that he just could not see. Something happens to his sight here. So notice the humbleness for three days. I mean, while I'm reading this to you, just, you know, uh, do me a favor. Close your eyes and don't open them for about 30 seconds. Imagine going through that for three days total darkness and you know you were able to see before and now not just three seconds three minutes three hours you know three days in total darkness and it appears that I don't know if uh, Saul here who later becomes Paul as I said I'm going to start calling him Paul because now he he starts following Jesus Christ notice he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. I don't know if he's fasting, uh, but 
or he's just not in the mood to eat or eat or drink I'm gonna assume he was fasting so there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias now everyone had heard about Paul uh, Saul remember who's now Paul remember um, this guy was like worse than Boba Fett so to speak he was uh, you know murdering Christians and in a vision Ananias hears his name Ananias and he said here I am Lord so the Lord said to him arise and go to the street called straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus for behold he is praying and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight now it would be like imagine um, Osama bin Laden when Osama bin Laden was alive before our US government took him out it would be like you know you're like not liking Osama bin Laden he's evil you know you wish the worst on him and it would be like <laughs> God saying go see Osama bin Laden and you're like what you know and so Ananias questions this Lord I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name remember the letters that Saul was asking for but the Lord said to him go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles kings and the children of Israel for I will show him here it is how many things he must suffer for my name's sake that is such a deep passage you know the Christian walk we're, we're very spoiled here in America we really don't have a lot of persecution as far as physical persecution and things like that like in North Korea you bring a Bible I mean your life is on the line I, in China you know you have to have a government approved church and the Christians are meeting in secret groups in China and uh, also in Africa uh, Christianity is just exploding and and now if you look below this video here I'll put the link in Iran Christianity is exploding in Iran of course they're having to meet in secret groups just like the early church did it, you know it's awesome but notice Jesus saying how many things you must suffer for my name's sake the Christian life is suffering for God it's, it's a temporary momentary act of suffering when you consider even if you live to be 115 years old what's that compared to eternity and is Christianity worth suffering for is Jesus Christ worth suffering for I would say yes definitely this is where we get all of our truth remember when they were going to put Jesus to death on the cross and they were Pontius Pilate was questioning him and he's Jesus was not answering he's just being very humble like a lamb going you know to the slaughter and Pontius Pilate says why aren't you answering me don't you know that I have the power you know to like put you to death or save your life and Jesus said look you wouldn't have any power if my father in heaven had not granted you that power so we also know where power comes from we know that Jesus Christ is the life so it's definitely worth suffering for you don't hear about a lot of atheist martyrs <laughs> you notice that they're not gonna die for nothing so notice here and Ananias went his way 
and entered the house and laying his hands on Paul he said brother Saul the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized so when he had received food he was strengthened then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus so here you have the enemy of the Christians becoming a friend and you notice what happens here what I see here guys notice immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized isn't that exactly how Christianity is when I was an atheist the world didn't make sense to me and why does this happen or why does this happen this way and what's the purpose and what and when I became a Christian it was like scales dropping from my eyes it was like pieces of the puzzle all coming together like a million piece puzzle all coming together at once and everything fit everything made sense it was like you're opening up a safe and the, you have to just get that right combination and then with Christianity the safe opens it was like the right combination everything makes absolute sense and, and it's just absolutely wonderful and <clears throat> another thing too is when you become a Christian and those of you that are not Christians you know you're not going to understand you're not going to let's not say understand you could understand it but you're not going to um, experience it let's talk about that let's say someone's talking to you about a great meal and we tell you all about it you could understand it but when you actually experience this great meal you're like wow you know like it's you look at a picture of a meal is different than actually experiencing the meal and eating the meal and enjoying the meal and that's a bad analogy I know but take it for what it's worth and and when you become a Christian it is literally like you can see it's like the matrix you know you're taking the pill where your eyes can be open and you can see the truth and that truth will set you free so notice immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God then all who heard were amazed and said, like, are you kidding me? Wasn't this the guy that's killing everybody? Is not, is this not he, excuse me, who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Notice what's happening here. He's confounding the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Do you know that they try and try, they've been trying since Jesus has risen from the dead, to put Christianity down? They've tried and tried different atheist regimes. Do you know the atheist regimes of Stalin, Pol Pot, uh, Kim Jong-il, Mao, the Khmer Rouge have murdered hundreds of millions of people in cold blood in the name of atheism and they do not want Christianity to grow but it keeps growing and growing because it's been said that truth crushed to the earth will rise again and no lie can live forever and Christianity is truth this is why people cannot stop it every knee will bow at the return of Jesus Christ now watch this so now the tables are turned they're trying to murder Saul now now after many days were passed the Jews plotted to kill him but their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him they're like lying in wait wanting to murder Saul this is not good when you're trying to put Christianity down and you're trying to crush it into the earth that your key 
Boba Fett dude that's going around killing all the Christians, your key assassin, so to speak, is joining the other side. So that now they really got to kill Saul because this is not stopping Christianity from growing. Now you have a major enemy of Christianity saying it is truth. So the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Notice they they're like, no way. They, they just can't believe that this guy that was murdering Christians is now saying, no, really, I believe. I believe I want to be a Christian also. And, you know, it's a funny story. You might have heard this uh, a while back. Uh, there is a certain city and there was a drought coming through the city. And some of the pastors said you know we should do something you know let's pray let's pray for rain and i'm i heard the story it's great so the pastor said okay on this day we're going to pray for rain so we can get the crops growing and we could have that okay and we're going to be praying on friday you know and then you know tuesday came in okay you guys ready remember this friday we're all going to meet and we're going to pray and then thursday came and then friday came and the pastor stood up and he said, so we're going to pray for rain. And everyone's like, yeah, rain. All the Christians saying it. And he's like, you really believe it's going to happen? They're like, yeah, it's going to happen. The rain. And the pastor said, you really, really believe it? And they go, oh, yes, pastor. And the pastor looked at him. He looked out in the crowd. He said, where's your umbrellas? <laughs> you believe it's going to rain? Where's your umbrellas at? And you know, a lot of times we're, wanting people to become Christian and we pray and pray and then they say they want to be and we're like no way you know and so we got to be prepared for that we have to be prepared for just evil sinful people leaving the dark side like me evil sinful people like me I used to be an atheist leaving the dark side and coming to Jesus Christ people like Saul and so notice, but even the Christians, they don't believe it. But look what it says here. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he, you know, Saul, had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So remember when they were trying to kill uh, Paul here, Saul? Um, you know, Barnabas is like, this guy is preaching boldly, you know, and now they're trying to kill him. He's putting his life on the line. You know, he has this faith in Jesus Christ. And you've heard a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. So rejoice when your faith is being tested because you will become a stronger Christian as you go through it and you pass through that. So, Barnabas sticks up for uh, Saul and says, look, he was speaking boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. So when the brethren found out, and this part's beautiful, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. So they accept him. It, that's just awesome. You know what I found? Um, I just feel like this just kind of popped into my mind so maybe there's a reason why uh, the Lord wants me to share this with you guys you know I think a lot of people they see the how how Christians are made fun of uh, on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and the secular world and they are thinking if I become a Christian that's what I'm going to get and if you're thinking of that and you're not a Christian, can I tell you something? You are going to be an awesome, skilled Christian. I love it. I love the debate, the, the friendly banter back and forth. I love talking to people that are not saved. 
I love talking to the most skeptical people about Christianity because a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And you know, when we say faith, the disciples did not have this blind faith. Okay, and this is a mistake I think a lot of people that are non-Christians think. Christians don't have faith, just some blind faith. We have faith in something that is real. You know, when you go to sit down on a chair, you have faith that that chair is going to hold you. It's trust. Think of it as trust. We have faith in something that is real. Guys, this is real. Jesus really died and he really rose from the dead. And what's awesome is he's really going to return. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And it just changes your whole life where you wake up every day and you're looking forward to the day. I'm always watching the news and seeing what's happened in the Middle East. And, and it's just such an exciting time you know, to be involved with. But if, if you're not a Christian yet, you know, don't let that stop you from becoming a Christian. You will get skills and you will be educated. Notice what happened here. Look at Saul. Notice Saul becomes a Christian, but but um, let's go back up here. I want to show you something. Notice it says, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus. There's just wonderful sites like reasonablefaith.org and what I would suggest is you know oh also creation.com by the way is great what I would suggest is you know even if you're an atheist try it for a week and and put yourself in the side of being a Christian and not to I'm not trying to cheapen what Christ has done. I don't mean try being a Christian. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, um, you know, this is what I did when I was in school and I was an atheist. I started looking at the Christian side. And I had some friends, great friends that were Christians, even though I was an atheist. And I started looking for a week, like if I was a Christian, how could I, how could I argue? What proof could I show? What evidence could I show that Christianity was real and again it just comes together like a puzzle it makes sense the proof and the evidence is there and I started thinking as an atheist I have no proof and evidence that atheism is true because you know how atheists will say I lack a belief in God <laughs> the truth is and I'm going to tell you the truth as an ex-atheist the reason why they say that is they lack any arguments against the existence of God now, you may be saying, well, what if they bring up this or what if they bring up that? I'm telling you, when you actually mix it up with atheists and you actually debate them, it strengthens your confidence even more that atheism's full of, do I dare say, crapola. And, you know, Christianity is truth. It's awesome. But when you see certain Christians falling away, what it usually is is they did not have the education on scripture how scripture was put together uh, and so they're talking to someone that is like one of these atheist internet infidel types and they're bringing up all these things against them ridiculing them and because the Christian's not educated like for example how Saul is here where he's confounding them with his wisdom then the Christian can fall away. I've seen it. I really believe these people were sincere, true Christians. I, that's my opinion. I really believe they were true, but they lacked education. They lacked the confidence. And I'm going to say something right now. I could say tons of names. Since I've been on YouTube, what, about 10 years? I'm not going to say names, of course. I've seen so many people fall away from Christianity. And I've seen more people come to Christianity. You know, Christianity has more people coming to it than atheism does, for example, or even Islam. But but here's what I've noticed. And I don't know why I'm getting off on this tangent, but I just feel like the Lord's telling me to tell you that. Is the people that fall away, inevitably, they don't stay in the word. They don't read scripture. They don't 
really look at how scripture was put together you know like they'll think the bible is just one book when the bible is literally a library it's multiple books together and letters and historic accounts of events it's it, but and when you actually look at how it's all put together you're like wow this is real this is real you guys i have absolutely no doubt that jesus died and, and rose from the dead so anyways i just thought i'd tell you that and i have seen in my years on youtube people that were christians and then they come and they go and they come and they go another thing too <laughs> let me just tell you i would never do this but a lot of christians they'll become atheists on youtube for money so they can get the adsense checks you know i'm just being honest with you i i can go right now i can talk to you about 20 different names and they'll sell out for, for money and they'll make good money i'm just telling you um on my uh shock of god channel that i had here i don't have it monetized i make absolutely no money but what i'm saying is if if someone's tempted by it they could make five thousand six thousand a month you know just by becoming uh an atheist and and start bashing you know jesus christ i will never do that i don't you can put literally let me think of something i like a lot <laughs> you can put like the lamborghini uh Countach or the lamborghini diablo or the kawasaki h2 i'm getting into material things here and you could put uh, uh, every dollar on the face of this planet on this table in front of me, if it would fit. And I would not take it. I would count it all rubbish. Because Jesus Christ was right when he said, what does it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? So I trust Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. He is awesome. I'm going to stick with the most famous, most famous person in world history that has changed the world for the better more than anybody. I'm going to stick with Jesus Christ. Um, just like, just like Saul does here. And so notice, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit they were multiplied just amazing so you know you're going to have suffering you're going to have that but watch what happens here and w now we're going to read from uh, let's go to acts um let's go to acts 21 8 so paul now is out there he's a major figurehead in spreading christianity Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. So he has four daughters and they're, they can prophesy. And watch what happens here. After we had been there, uh, this is a trip, a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Now watch what happens here. Kind of gives you chills coming over to us he took Paul's belt remember Paul's Saul now tied his own hands and feet with it and said so imagine this someone comes up to you let's say you're Paul and they take your belt and let's say I, I come up to you I'm this prophet let's say Agabus and I come up to you and I take your belt and I start tying my hands like, like I'm bound and my feet and then this is what the prophet says to you the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. So notice they're pleading with Paul. Oh, my gosh. No, don't go. You know, you're going to be killed. Then Paul answered and Paul's just absolutely epic. Look at this. Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, 
but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Wow. That's amazing. And um, I want to confess to you guys, you know, I've always asked myself that because I love life. I love, you know, fellowshipping with other believers. I love, you know, everything about life, you know, especially since I become a Christian. And and I ask myself, I'm like, I'm always keeping myself in check that I'm strengthened, that if it happens that I will be willing to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. And I want to tell you something. I've talked to pastors and not just one pastor, a lot of pastors, and they're saying that some serious stuff is coming down in the United States. I'm not going to name names, but these are pastors that many of you would know, you know, good Christian pastors. And for example, I'm just going to tell you about one thing. Can you imagine if Beto O'Rourke was president? You know what he said he would do? He would fine and imprison pastors and he would take away their tax, the church's tax exempt status, which is another way of saying the government's going to raid the churches and get money from them. If we don't say that homosexuality is good and not evil. He actually said that in debate, that he would take away the church's tax-exempt status. That This is some scary stuff that this guy is running. Now, he's a Democrat, which, uh, uh, seriously, if you're a Christian, really, please, for God's sakes, check yourself. You cannot vote Democrat and be a Christian. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. The most pro-abortion political party. I'm not saying the Republicans or the independents don't have their issues, but I like that Trump's pro-life. I know he's a sinner. I'm a sinner too. You're a sinner also. But those are our choices. I like that Trump is pro-Christianity. And, he, and as a matter of fact, Trump removed a law that was put in place by Democrats that said a pastor couldn't give his political viewpoint in church. Or again, they would take away his, the pastor's uh, tax exempt status. So anyways, you know, where was I going? <laughs> where was I going with it? Oh yeah. So I always want to keep myself in check and I want to make sure that I don't fall in love with this world so much where um, I forget that I'm just a, a sojourner we're just traveling we're just passing through so I, I want to always be willing you know when push comes to shove I want to be willing to lay down my life for the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ that he died and rose again and that he is God King of Kings Lord of Lords and notice um, they beg Paul to stay but he would not be dissuaded we gave up and said the Lord's will be done. This is great. Are you a strong Christian that cannot be dissuaded or are you dissuaded? Um, would you be willing to say what scripture says that yes, homosexuality is sin, that yes, the, uh, the baby in the womb or outside the womb is a life. There's scripture that God said, even before I, I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Um, would you be willing to say that or is the world like Plato just crushing you and trying to form you, you know, into um, where you just have the label of a Christian, but you're not staying rooted and grounded in the word of God? Fortunately, I'm going to tell you something. The Christians that I've met, they are rooted and grounded in the word of God. They are not going to let scripture evolve with the decline of our society you know how scripture says God never changes he never changes and scripture never changes you know scripture says in, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God 
the word is truth it never changes so let's get like plato and conform the world to what we believe and not the other way around amen huh let's say amen to that so notice um after this we started on our way up to jerusalem now this is where it gets dicey some of the disciples from caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Manasseh, where we went to stay he was a man from cyprus and one of the early disciples so now we're going to jump ahead here because this is where it gets interesting when they heard this because uh, Paul greeted them and told them what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed, informed excuse me, that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, which wasn't what Paul was doing. He was saying that Jesus is a fulfillment of what Moses was even talking about telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs what shall we do they will certainly hear that you have come so do what we tell you there are four men with us who have made a vow take these men join in their purification rites and pay their expenses now watch this so that they can have their head shaved then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law so they're trying to get paul to to basically be more legalistic and less having his faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. In other words, you've heard the saying, be all to all men. Like in other words, uh, let's say you have a friend and they're always you know, going to uh, sports events, and but they're unsaved. So you're like, well, you know what? I'm going to go to some sports events with them. So you know, I can talk to them more about Christ. Or, Man, I'm going to buy them lunch. Or, I'm going to buy their dinner. I'm going to do this for them. And you're doing all these things for them. This is what they're saying to Paul. Maybe if you do all these things, um, then you can, <laughs> you can get to them about the truth about Jesus Christ. So look, so the next day Paul took them in and purified himself along with them. So he shouldn't have done that. He goes ahead and he gets into this legalism and, you know, because he's trying to, you know, show that that uh, he's trying to be a man to all men and trying to get on their good side. So notice what happens. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the day of the purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. And then look what happens. Paul arrested when the seven days were nearly over. Some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. Now, you notice Paul didn't bring the Greeks into the temple, but they're saying this. They had previously seen... Oh, no, so notice right here, yeah, so... The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut while they were trying to kill him. Notice, they're trying to kill him. They're pummeling him probably with their fist. News reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in the uproar, was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. So the commander of the Roman troops runs down to the crowd and stops Paul from being murdered. But you know what I see here, guys? Notice Paul tries to do it more the worldly way. He tries to do it. Um, there's this myth uh, in Christianity that just become their buddy old pal and almost like you're pouring maple syrup on them all the time and try to get them to come to Jesus Christ. No, the word of God preached boldly and without compromise will bring people whose hearts are ready to salvation in Jesus Christ. But I'll see people like they're just they'll spend all their time with their unsaved friend doing all these different events and everything and they never really get into the word of God with them and they're thinking that that's going to you know bring them to Christ 
And I think some of it is they just don't have the guts to preach the word of God to them. But notice right here, it didn't work. Paul's like, okay, I'll do that. And he, he helps um, go through this purification thing with these other guys. And it, it, it doesn't work out for him. So the crowd keeps saying, get rid of them, get rid of them. They, they, want, they don't even want to hear Paul. But notice, as the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? And so the commander's like, do you speak Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. So, so Paul's saying, let me speak to this giant mob. So you yeah, picture Paul his eyes all swollen, his lips bleeding. And he's saying, let me speak <laughs> to these people that just tried to kill him. And this is amazing. So Paul, the, the commander's like, go for it. So Paul stands on the steps and he motions to the crowd, you know, like, calm down, like probably has his hand up, like, you know, just be quiet, be quiet. And notice, because Paul was absolutely brilliant, he speaks to them in their language. He said to them in Aramaic. So this probably shock and awed the crowd. And now picture this. These are the people that just tried to beat the hell out of them and murder them. And look what Paul calls them brothers and fathers. This is interesting. Uh, would you call someone your brother and your father? They just tried to murder you. Look at the love that he has for them. And he says, listen now to my defense. Now, remember before, he's um, doing the rituals and he's doing all this. But now look what Paul says. Now, when you become a Christian, which if you love good, you'll become a Christian. If you love truth, you will become a Christian. If you thirst for righteousness like, like a deer, a thirsty deer out in the heat, you know, pants for the brook. If you thirst for righteousness, you will be a Christian. It can be found in Christianity. But when you do become a Christian, you're going to notice your pastor says, share your testimony with people. And the reason why pastors say this is because that really brings people to Jesus Christ. Below this video, I'm going to put another video that I did about my true ghost story, which didn't bring me completely to Christ, but it proved to me that the spiritual realm actually uh, exists. And of course, I'm a Christian now, but it was like a progression of things that opened my eyes. Like I talk about later, like the scales falling off my eyes. So pastors will tell you, share your testimony. Now to you, because you're a humble, sweet, wonderful person, and you're like, what's so exciting about that? But I love hearing people's testimony, and people like hearing my testimony, and, and everyone likes to hear the other person's testimony, because it's interesting. You know, um, I may not think my testimony is that interesting, but you may not think yours is, but your testimony is really interesting, and what I like about it comes from your heart and so it draws people so watch this though so so Paul says forget about all this other stuff about doing you know the purification of this I'm just going to tell them what happened to me so when they heard them speak to them in Aramaic they became very quiet it like shocked them like wow he's speaking in our language then Paul said I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia but brought up in this city, Cilicia. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters. Remember, we talked about that earlier. I obtained letters from them 
to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. <laughs> you see how he's doing it. He's building the story and they're like, you know, you can't walk away from this. You want to hear the punchline, right? So he says about noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. So my companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people what you have seen and heard. And now what you are waiting for, get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. So notice he's saying before he even sees the result, <laughs> Jesus is telling him, you know, leave. They're not going to accept your testimony. But Paul says, Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. So the very first Christian martyr that's killed is Stephen and Stephen also was absolutely brilliant and um, I did a Bible study on Stephen but it, it's I, I'm not going to get into that right now but Stephen at the very end of this long beautiful uh, sermon that he's preaching to these people that are thinking they're going to kill him he just gutsy and bold He's showing them all these prophets that God is sending them and the people keep killing the prophets of God. And Stephen, at the very end, after he's all done, he says to them, which of the prophets haven't you killed? And it ticks off the people. But he was so bold. And you and I bet like Stephen just had this righteous anger that these people did not want to hear what God had to tell them. And he's like, which of the prophets haven't you killed? And when they heard that, they just got very angry at Stephen and they, and they killed him. And, and Paul was there just egging him on. And notice he was guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. What, what, did they, what does this mean, clothes? Well, they stoned him. And you know how they would wear these robes and stuff? So they would really want to get some strength not to be morbid, but they want to get some strength to the throwing of the stones. They would take off their clothes so their arms are more free, and they just pummeled poor Stephen to death. So notice, Paul says, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So the crowd, let's see how this... <laughs> How this reacts was Jesus right or was Paul right remember Jesus said they're not going to listen the crowd listened to Paul until he said this then they raised their voices and shouted ah rid the earth of him he's not fit to live as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks he directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, 
is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man's a Roman citizen. So the commander, because you know, that you, you get in a lot of trouble if you flog a Roman citizen without uh, his trial. So the commander says, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. And Paul's like, well, I was freeborn. I was born a citizen. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had, he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. So this is the wonderful, you know, <laughs> stuff that you have to look forward to uh, when you become a Christian. And what is it that makes people say, I don't care about the persecution? It's not a natural thing that that Paul is killing Christians and all of a sudden he does a complete reversal and he becomes one himself and now he's willing to die for it. This is not something natural that happens. This is spiritual. It's absolutely spiritual. And the one thing that I've had to learn as I've matured as a Christian and I've educated myself more and more is I don't go by feelings. You know, you feel a certain way about something, but the spiritual realm is totally independent of your feelings. And so notice, as we go to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says it, perfectly in first corinthians 15 i call it the let's deal with reality passages and and paul is like look let's not beat around the bush let's just deal with the facts let's end it with this guys look he says look now brothers and sisters i want to remind you of the gospel i preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, Watch this right here. We're going to talk about that. Though some have fallen asleep. He's talking to people that have passed on. Talking about people who have passed on. Then he appeared to James. That's Jesus' brother. Then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What does this mean here? Most of whom are still living. Have you ever heard how atheists will say, Oh, it's like the game of telephone where one person says they saw Jesus and then another person s says, but it really didn't happen. Jesus never rose from the dead. This is what they'll say. It was just changed. The story was changed like the game of telephone. What really happened was Jesus died and then someone said they might have heard his voice. And then, and then over a long period of time, it was that he raised from the dead. The story got changed. But notice, this is not the game of telephone. Paul is saying... They're still living. People that witness Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead, they're still living. It's not the game of telephone. You can go directly to the first. If you want to say it's like the game of telephone, you can go directly to the first person in this big game of telephone and ask them, and they would say, yes, I saw Jesus Christ resurrected. But, but notice, Paul goes on. In other words, he's saying this is real. He says, if I preach that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If, in other words, it's black and white. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he didn't. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him. In fact, the dead are not raised. So it, Paul's basically saying, look, 
did Jesus rise from the dead or did he not rise from the dead? Don't be double-minded. Stick with what really happened. And notice he says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. He's making it perfectly clear. Watch what he says. He says, you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of most people pity. But here it is. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Because Jesus was 100% man, 100% God. For as an Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then he who comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. This is sweet gentle meek Jesus notice he's going to put all enemies of Christianity under his feet the last enemy to be destroyed is death for he has put everything under his feet now when it says that everything has put has been put under him it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ when he has done this then the son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead if the dead are not raised at all? Why are people baptized for them? See, people were coming in saying, no, nah, there really was no resurrection. And Paul's saying, look, we witnessed Jesus Christ. He died. He rose again. And notice he's saying you could even go talk to people that had witnessed him uh, raised from the dead. Some have passed away but there were still people alive. And so notice he says, do not be misled. And it's interesting that he says this. He's talking about people, the naysayers to the resurrection. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. So he does not pull any punches. He's saying, look, People that are saying that Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead are ignorant of God. He's talking about the witnesses. He's talking about how he, uh, earlier on he talked about how he witnessed Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. So I love this phrase, and let's end it here. Notice, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. Amen to that. God bless you guys.